The Cabinet of Dr. Calgary. Nosferatu. En Metropolis are only a few examples of the German Expressionism, a movement that defined the cinematic language and its influence on future filmmakers was enormous. On today's episode in our History of Cinema series, we will discuss about how German Expressionism started, what were the characteristics of this movement, who were the biggest artists during those years, which movies are the most influential, and how the movement ceased to exist. To begin with, we will have to mention some historical facts about the cinema situation in Germany. During World War I, and specifically in 1916, Germany decided to ban all imported films. This gave the opportunity for the production of many local movies as there was no competition. The next year, Universum Film Action, or simply UFA, was created. UFA was a company that united film production activities and gave more means to the rise of German film industry and more freedoms to the artists to experiment. This freedom already existed to other kinds of art. Expressionism had already appeared on painting, literature and architecture in Northern Europe, but it would be very successful in Germany prior to World War I with two groups, the Die Brücke, which means the bridge and was formed in Dresden in 1905, and the Der Blaue Reiter, or simply the Blue Rider, which was formed in Munich in 1911. These two groups with very notable artists, including Erich Heckel, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, Vasil Kandinsky, Paul Klee and others, tried to distinguish themselves from their traditional forms of art, managed to showcase their deeper emotions with their subjective perspective and highlighted the fear and agony of the artists and the humors in general on the beginning of the 20th century. With this freedom in the artistic expression and the influence from the two groups we mentioned, the filmmakers had the perfect chance to use the expressionistic ideas in the film. Some film historians claim that the Student of Prague, directed by Stellan Rai and released in 1913, is the first expressionist film. We have spoken a lot about this film on our episode about the rise of national cinemas and you can find it in our channel, so please subscribe and hit the bell button, but all we say now is that probably it was just a precursor to the German expressionism cinema, which in our opinion started in 1920 with the film The Cabinet of Dr. Calgary. The Cabinet of Dr. Calgary, directed by Robert Wiener and released in 1920, is the movie that defines this movement and is considered one of the best movies of all times. And we will explain why right now. Written by Karl Mayer and Hans Janowicz, The Cabinet of Dr. Calgary tells the story of a hypnotist who uses a somnambulist to commit murders. Both writers have expressed through the script their past experiences with asylums, sex crimes, joyous feasts, But most importantly, it was their accusation against the cruel World War I, which they both hated as they were pacifists. Through this movie, they tried to indicate the atrocities that war and authority can create by combining all these elements into the insane Dr. Calgary. However, when we speak about the cabinet of Dr. Calgary, we should pay our respects to the artists who created the set design. We are talking about Hermann of Arm, Walter Reimann, and Walter Rothrich. Without these three, This movie would not have been the same. They were the ones who suggested a graphic style which would oppose realism, something that excited Erich Pommer, the producer of the movie. Everything in this movie is distorted. From the buildings which are drawn as sharp pointed forms with oblique and curving lines, to the streets that are spiraling and can cause dizziness and claustrophobia, to the chairs that are extremely tall and the stairs totally uneven, we can easily say that Calgary was the first movie ever to deliberately use the sets and in general the mise-en-scene as a key role to the action of the movie. In addition to this, we should add the expressive and extensive use of makeup and costumes so that the characters could become one with the set, thus maximizing the horror. One of the most famous film critics of all times, Roger Ebert, called The Cabinet of Dr. Calgary as the first true horror film. And for sure, we will have to praise the expressionist play of the actors in this film. Conrad Veidt, who is the somnopolist, was the perfect man for this role. His big eyes, highlighted with this unnatural makeup, create the ultimate horror. Werner Krauss, our Caligari, has this paranoid smile that would be used by thousands of actors during the next hundred years. 
Finally, we should observe that the movie has one of the biggest plot twists in the history of cinema, but we will not say more so we don't spoil it for our friends who haven't seen the movie yet. Having said all the above, we come to the conclusion that the cabinet of Dr. Caligari set the foundations of the German Expressionism in the years to come. It was a massive success both in Germany and abroad. Its legacy and the interpretation of the movie has given food for thought to many film scholars. I totally recommend you to read Siegfried Kakauer's book From Caligari to Hitler, which examines the steps that the German society followed after the World War I and how movies like Caligari helped to raise the idea to the collective subconscious about the need of a leader in hard times. And since it is a habit in this video series to rate the movies that I believe everyone should watch, we have to claim that The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is the first true masterpiece of the seventh art and our rating is 9 out of 10 stars. Robert Wiener, the director of the movie, had already started his career since 1912. However, most of his films prior to Caligari are lost and the same applies for some of them after it. He would never again meet the same success he had with The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari although he tried to implement some of the expressionistic elements in his next movies. Two of his next movies that have some of these elements are his 1923's film Raskolnikov, based on Fyodor Dostoyevsky's novel Crime and Punishment, and his 1925's film The Hounds of Orlak, where a pianist loses his hands on an accident and the surgeon transplants him new hands that were taken by a murderer. After Nazis took over the power in Germany in 1933, Wiener, went to exile in Budapest and from there to Paris. He even had discussed with Jacques Cocteau to remake the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, this time with sound, but hopefully this never happened. Vine died in 1938, before finishing directing his last movie, Ultimatum. Although his career was uneven, he gave his Caligari to the world and we are thankful to him for that. Moving on, we will speak about Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau one of the masters of German Expressionism, whose name is written with golden letters in the history of cinema. He would start filmmaking in 1919, and in only 12 years, he would create some of the most iconic movies ever made. Murnau started his film career after World War I. His first films are now considered lost, but they had already received good acclaims. Two of the three films he directed in 1921, The Journey into the Night and The Haunted Castle, have survived and we can see that he already started exploring the ideas behind German Expressionism. However, in 1922, he directed Nosferatu, a symphony of horror, one of the most emblematic movies ever made and the true paradigm of German Expressionism. Murnau did not have the rights for Bram Stoker's book Dracula. Therefore, he named his protagonist Count Orlok and made few other changes to names, but the story is practically the same. Nevertheless, he managed to create an excellent silent horror movie. Murnau used set designs with wildly non-realistic, geometrically absurd angles, along with designs painted on walls and floors to represent lights, shadows and objects. He created a claustrophobic atmosphere which shocked the audience back at the time. In order to achieve this shock, the physical appearance of his Count Orlok was essential. His big hook nose the large bald head and the hands with their huge fingernails, alongside with the excessive makeup, made Cow Dorlock a scary figure. Max Schreck, who portrayed this character, was outstanding. The way he walks around his victims is haunting. The scene where Cow Dorlock climbs the stairs to go to his potential victim and the shadow created is, according to many people, including me, as one of the most iconic scenes in the history of cinema. In general, many directors have claimed that Nosferatu inspired them and tried to create the ambience in their movie. There is a remake made by Werner Herzog in 1979 called Nosferatu, the Vampire. And also Robert Eggers has made his own adaptation of Nosferatu. For us though, Nosferatu, a symphony of horror, will be always one of the most emblematic movies of all times, especially if you are a fan of horror and our rating for this masterpiece is 9 out of 10 stars. Murnau directed also the movies Phantom and The Burning Soil, both in 1922, but not with the same success as in Nosferatu. In 1923, he directed the movie The Expulsion, which is mostly lost, and he will come back in 1924 with two movies, The Finances of the Grand Duke and The Last Laugh. And we will start a bit more to the latter. Karl Mayer wrote the screenplay and the protagonist was Emil Jannings, one of the most important German actors of that time. 
Mornau moved away from the expressionist movement and followed more the conventions of the Kammerspiel films, or chamber dramas in English. Kammerspiel was a movement that also arose in Germany during the 1920s and focused mostly on the dramas of the lower and middle classes. In this film, Jannings plays the role of a doorman in a famous hotel and he is very proud of his work and the position he believes he has in the society. When he will lose this job, his world will turn upside down. It is really important to note the way Murnau uses his camera in this film and more specifically, we will have to mention the amazing traveling which he uses to portray the lucrative food of the hotel in comparison with the protagonist's fame. Our rating for this film is 8 out of 10 stars. In 1925, Murnau will direct Tartuffe, based on Molière's play, and in 1926, he will direct Faust, based on Goethe's novel, and Murnau will collaborate again with Emil Jannings, who plays the role of Mephisto. Faust was a financial flop and the last movie Murnau shot in Germany. However, it depicts the return of Murnau to his expressionistic ideas, especially in the set designs and in general in the mise-en-scene. The movie is now praised also for the use of some special effects which were prior to the ones that Lang used for his Metropolis, as we will see in a bit. Jannings gives one of the best performances of his career and it is probably the best adaptation of Faust's novel. Our rating is 8.5 out of 10 stars. Murnau emigrated to Hollywood and signed with Fox Studio. The first movie he made in USA was Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans in 1927. It is one of the few silent movies that are always on the list with the best movies ever made. It even won the Academy Award for Unique and Artistic Picture in the first Academy Awards back in 1929. A story of passion, deception, a contrast between life in the countryside and the big city, a passionate song of people who love and suffer. Murnau used several techniques from German Expressionism, especially focusing on the enormous sets. Our rating is 8 out of 10 for this film. Sunrise was a huge success, something that did not happen with his next two movies, Four Devils in 1928, which is now considered lost, and City Girl in 1930. It was the first years of sound in movies, and Murnau did not manage to adjust. Therefore, he decided to leave Fox Studio and go on a journey to the South Pacific. Over there, along with Robert Flaherty, the legendary documentary director, they started shooting the movie Taboo, A Story of the South Seas. Murnau had a fight with Flaherty and finished the movie on his own and without sound as he preferred it. Taboo is a docu-fiction, meaning that it used both the techniques of documentary and fiction. It shows the story of two lovers split in two chapters, Paradise and Paradise Lost, the former on an island where the lovers are happy until they have to escape in order to stay alive, and the second in a colonized island and their exploitation by the Western civilization, an emblematic movie which deserves our 8 out of 10 stars rating. Unfortunately, Murnau would not manage to see his movie on screen. He died one week before his official premiere in a car accident. He was only 42 years old when he died and he would probably have given us more amazing films had he lived longer. Moving on, the next director who defined German Expressionism and the world of cinema in general was Friedrich Christian Anton Lang, better known as Fritz Lang. The Austrian director started his career in 1919 and he would direct movies till 1960, but for now, we will focus only on his German period. Lang had already directed seven films until 1921, but it was his film Destiny, which was the first with clear expressionistic ideas. A woman tries desperately to reunite with her dead boyfriend, and after an encounter with death, she is given three chances in different times in history to save at least one person whose life is threatened. The image of death, the special effects used for this movie, and the exaggerated acting represent the approach Lang did to the German Expressionism. In 1922, Fritz Lang directed Dr. Mabuse, The Gabbler, which was a movie in two parts similar to the Fatima series by Louis Feuillade, although way more darker and way more criticizing to the German society. The movie focuses on Dr. Mabuse, who is a criminal mastermind and uses hypnosis and mind control in order to gain what he wants. Although there are some expressionistic themes and set designs, this movie is not strictly belonging to the German expressionism. But his next two-part series, The Nibelungs, definitely belongs to the movement we are discussing to this episode. Both parts, 
Die Nibelungen, Siegfrieds Death and Die Nibelungen, Krimhild's Revenge, were directed in 1924. Based upon the epic poem, The Song of Nibelungs, which was written around 1200 AD, the first part covers the adventures of Siegfried in the battlefield and the betrayal he receives, while in the second part we see Krimhild's efforts to take revenge for Siegfried's death. The set designs are spectacular. From the huge stairs to the mechanical dragons, all these gigantic constructions were able to be depicted due to Lang's vision and his talented colleagues Otto Hunde and Karl Wolbrecht. The costumes and the makeup are also astonishing and really inspired by the expressionistic movement. The whole movie, a hymn to the great past of the German myths, was also a representation of the German audience who was still living in a post-war instability with huge inflation and needed an epic drama in order to believe in their nation. If you are a fan of epic fantasy, like Lord of the Rings, then you should definitely watch these movies. In 1927, Fritz Lang would direct his next film, Metropolis, which we can easily say that it was his magnum opus. Metropolis is set in a futuristic urban dystopia and depicts the story between Frederick, the son of the city master, and Maria, a woman from the working class, and their attempts to cover the gaps between the ruling and the working class in order to live together in unity. Lang worked again with Hude and Wolbrecht in order to set up this dystopic environment. Inspired by Bauhaus, Cubism, and Futurism, this expressionistic masterpiece is one of the first science fiction films to get critical acclaim and be considered one of the most influential films ever made. And there are so many reasons for that. The huge skyscrapers and the buildings with their curvy angles, the excessive makeup, the exaggerating acting of the actors are only some of the elements that Lang took from the expressionists and used them to his film. The use of machine men a robot that was constructed for this film is pretty astonishing. The industrial machine which powers the city resembles as a sacrifice of the workers to it. Fritz Lang would also use huge amounts of water in order to drown the city that was created for the needs of this film. We need also to comment that the movie used many biblical references with the most characteristic to be the new Tower of Babel to highlight the huge differences between the rich and the poor. As a rule, Lang used other themes that were relevant to the Weimar Republic, including industrialism, communism and fascism, and the movie can have different and controversial receptions based on your ideological orientation. For sure, Lang dreamed the futuristic Germany and wanted to pass his message about the unity of the people, hoping that his message would reach the German audience. Although the film did not go so great on the movie theaters, and most of the critics did not receive it properly, the later reception and rediscovery of the film has given to it the glory it truly deserves. One of the most important movies of all times, with our rating to be 9 out of 10 stars. After Metropolis, Lang directed Spies in 1928 and Woman in the Moon in 1929, with the latter to be an attempt to recreate the special effects he used in Metropolis, but without the same success. Although many film historians cite that German expressionism ended with Metropolis, my personal idea is that the movie M, directed by Fritz Lang in 1931, is the last movie of this movement. It is the first sound film Lang directed and he was blessed to have Peter Lorre as the main protagonist, who is a serial killer of little children. One of the key elements of German expressionism was the darkest parts of the human soul and the way to see from a distorted point of view, something that is clearly established in this film. The long shadows in the dark along with the music light motif, which is Edward Kriegs in The Hall of the Mountain King, that lore whistles throughout the movie, create a claustrophobic atmosphere that can be easily compared to the German silent films of the previous decade. This movie, who is a precursor of noir films that Lang could master the next years in USA, is a must-watch film for everyone and it deserves our 8.5 out of 10 stars. For the record, the last film Lang would direct in Germany was The Testament of Dr. Mabuse in 1933, which was a sequel to his 1922's movie. We have spoken a lot about the holy trinity of the German expressionism, aka Wiener, Murnau and Lang, but there were other important directors who made exquisite work with expressionistic themes. For example, did you know that many years prior to Frankenstein's appearance on the screen, there was one other movie that depicted the creation of a living being from something not alive? 
Of course, we're speaking about the movie The Golem, How He Came Into the World, directed by Paul Wegener and Carl Besse in 1920. In this film, a Jewish rabbi realizes that his people are into danger and summons an ancient spirit in order to give life to a huge pile of clay which comes to life after a paper with a magical word is inserted into his chest. The rabbi, who uses initially the golem as an assistant, will later use it to protect his people, but things take a radical twist. This movie is considered a key expressionistic film, especially for its creative and dazzling photography, the costumes and the setup, and managed to make horror a crucial element to the expressionistic movement, in a similar way as Caligari. Apart from being a forerunner to Frankenstein, and in general to horror movies where non-living creatures come into life, this movie can be seen as a precursor of what will happen to the Jewish people in Germany with the rise of Adolf Hitler's power. From Morn to Midnight is the next movie we are going to review. Directed by Karl Heinz Martin in 1920, this movie is one of the most radical films of the whole expressionistic movement. The stylized distorted sets are even more avant-garde than the ones in Caligari. While watching this film, I had the impression that Lars von Trier may have been inspired by this film in order to create the sets for his 2003's film Dogville. But back to From More to Midnight. This film, which consists of five parts, shows the life of a cashier and how it changes from the moment he steals a big amount of cash from the bank he is working and how he explores the life on the streets. The sets remind to us a theatrical stage. They are drawn as paintings on the wall. The costumes are very well used based on the different occasions. The theme of death is again present and the cashier is very afraid of it, which is deliberately shown through the exaggerating acting of Ernst Deutsch, the main protagonist of the film. Robert Nepak, the set designer, did an amazing job which would influence the next expressionistic movies of this decade and not only. Our rating is 7.5 out of 10 stars. Warning Shadows, directed by Arthur Robinson in 1923, is a typical example of a film that tries to explore the psychology of its characters and tries to reveal the darkest secrets of their souls. Warning Shadows shows a rich man orchestrating a puppet show for a group of bachelors. However, the puppeteer is revealed to be a witch and the young men are consequently cursed with terrible dreams that serve a harsh warning. Although difficult to watch, since there are no intertitles, the camera movement and the acting, along with the costumes, the makeup and the visual effects make this movie an important part of German Expressionism. Why this movement, though, ceased to exist? Most of the key figures of the movement, from directors and writers to actors and set designers, they had already moved to work in the large studios of the United States. In addition to this, the arrival of sound made extremely complicated the situation for the Expressionist filmmakers to tell their stories the same way as they were doing it during the silent era. But most importantly, the rise of the Nazis to the power was the final hit to the German Expressionism. Joseph Goebbels was appointed the Reich Minister of Propaganda and his mission was to control all aspects of culture, including cinema. Their goal was to create movies that would focus on the superiority of the German nation and the dangers it had to deal with other nations or ethnic groups inside Germany who could destroy the country. Under these circumstances, Many filmmakers, even the ones who did not have Jewish origin, were forced to exile and search their luck in other countries. And that's the end of our episode about German Expressionism, how it started and grew, its most important movies, and how it came to an end, although its influence remains even nowadays. In the description, you will find all the movies that we mentioned with their English title, the year they were released, and the name of their director. We would love to read your comments about our work, your suggestions, and movies or directors we didn't mention. Finally, please like this video and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss our next episodes. And most important, if you like this video, share it to your friends. Until the next time we meet again, stay safe and watch movies.